Welcome back to Vintage and Stuff podcast with your host, me, Drew Heifetz, the show where we talk to the unique and crazy people in the vintage world, what makes them tick, what they do on the daily basis, their thoughts and opinions on the world and the scene. Today, we have Jacob Starr, who runs the vlog, The Star Life, and at Thrift Row Vintage, very successful YouTuber, vlogger, also vintage seller. He's been traveling around America for the last six, eight months, stopping in at different bins and towns and seeing pickers and just vlogging the whole thing, uh, having some cool, crazy adventures. Uh, super, super great guy and uh, awesome conversation we had. So this is a wicked episode that you need to need to listen to the end. Um, grew, grew, grew up in Tacoma. Talk a lot about that. Talk a lot about his history in streetwear as well. He started with streetwear and then moved into the thrift halls and all these different things. Interesting progression. He has great opinions on the scene. So uh, yeah, enjoy this episode. And if you guys want, this is the free 45 minute version, okay? If you guys want the full, this was like a two and a half hour, three hour episode, guys. If you want the full three hours of this episode, you gotta jump on the Patreon, link down below in the show notes, or you can join here on YouTube and the full video is uploaded in both places and the full audio on the Patreon, okay? Also, if you want to shop FSMFrankVintage.com, check that out. We talk about it in the episode, but I got to shout out Stock Exchange by Frankie Collective is happening May 27th, 708 Powell Street, Vancouver. A day of vintage reworks, sneakers, food, drink, activations. It's going to be super fun. Uh, it's uh, at our new facility. We have a fill a bag sale happening same day at the same facility. It's all going down May 27th. 708 Powell Street, Vancouver. Make sure you are there and make sure you spread the word. We're going to be doing this often. Okay? That's it. Without further ado, here you go. Jacob Starr. Jacob, thank you for joining me today on Vintage and Stuff podcast. I've been trying to get you on for a while. I've like had you on my radar as a guest for a minute now um, for a few reasons because you're kind of like, well, you are big on YouTube, so I see you all the time popping up. You're big on social. You're doing these cool, crazy adventures all around the country, which is kind of an envious position to be in. And I think so many people in vintage are envious of your travels, it seems so fun. And we're, and anybody in vintage loves the hunt and you're just on the road hunting all the time, documenting it. So it's super cool. So welcome to the show, dude. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here, man. Uh, like I said, it's an honor. Uh, I talked about this a little bit, but um, yeah, I really appreciate you because obviously like when I first came into this, I remember shopping on your website. So it's like kind of a cool full circle moment. And I definitely appreciate you having me. We'll talk more about that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, dude. Thank you. So I want to kick it back to the beginning here. You know, it's interesting with you because you are sort of this in this world of streetwear, sneakers, and vintage. And I look back on your YouTube. It's been like 10 years. I went to the beginning of your YouTube, right? <laughs> yeah. And your first video is funny. You're like, you're like, we're going to this college. We're going to go show. We went to party at some university <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is rad. And then it kind of goes into like streetwear hauls, different like um, sneaker videos, reviews. 
and then like I guess a couple of years ago you sort of like moved more into vintage so you know I, I want to kind of start there like what was this transition into more thrift content more vintage content like that whole transition so uh, the first video on my channel is actually <clears throat> probably like the 20th video. I privated a lot of my early videos because even some of the early ones now are still so bad. Uh, but I privated a lot of the early videos and I kept that one. I think that was like one of the only ones I kept from like 2012 or 2013. Um, I kind of did wonder that. I was thinking like, was there previous videos? Because it already looked like at that point you were like professional on like your setup and everything. Yeah, like, it's funny looking back, because like, I look at back at those videos, and I think like, man, like, the quality was so bad. But basically, I've always been into streetwear. Uh, um, and then uh, I started doing YouTube videos because uh, of someone I don't know if you know, Jacob Keller. Um, no. So he does YouTube where he did YouTube videos back in the day, he was like, one of the first ones to do like streetwear reviews. And this was like back in the Karma Loop days. Um, I remember Karma Loop. Hell yeah! I feel like you were definitely, uh, yeah. I feel like you knew know about Karma Loop for sure because I remember, like, like I was saying before, it's like with your website. I remember looking at Karma Loop, and then occasionally I would see things pop up that were like vintage esque, and then I would see your website. I feel like did a good job of catering to like certain trends at the time, like the like Chanel type bomber things, or like I would see like all the snapbacks. Like you, your website always had like cool ass snapbacks back then, and that was when like snapback craze was going insane um yeah yeah karma yeah, so loop like, just for people that don't know karma loop was this website that would like do big drops and they would clear out products so you could like brands would sell their shit on karma loop and it would be like this huge drop and we actually sold stuff on karma loop a few times they would like they would hit us up and be like we think we can move a thousand snapbacks do you want to do a big drop and we would do that on karma loop and they would run they would have time limits on all the drops right so it would mm -hmm. like be on there for like three days and then you had to like grab it before it was timed out or whatever. But yeah, that was huge in streetwear for a while. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people now don't even know about Karma Loop, which is crazy because I think that was like the biggest thing in streetwear at that point. Um, yeah. And so I've always kind of been into streetwear. Uh, I was never really into like vintage because uh, um, before like 2012, 2013, like I hated thrift stores. Like thrift stores was where my mom would take me as a kid. And like when I joined the military and I started getting a little bit of money, like the last thing I wanted to do was wear dirty old clothes or like what I perceived as dirty old clothes. Because prior to that, yeah. like all my homies would like clown me for wearing the same hoodie every day or like the same pants every day, the same shoes every day. And so um, I was never really like into it. But back then it's like it, a lot of people wasn't. I mean, this is like, yeah, like I said, 2011, 2012. I think my first trip to the thrift was 2013 with someone you might remember uh, who you should get on here, uh, DP The Truth. He was like one of the OG thrifters. I don't know if you ever saw his stuff, but he was like in the realm of Iceman 289. Um, he was in the realm of like Professor Snaps and all of them. So my first thrift video yeah. ever was with him. And then I didn't find anything. And I was instantly like, well, that sucked. Uh, what a waste of a day. <laughs> And then yeah. um, uh, my bro, Paul, so those guys all started making videos. And then Paul Cantu started uh, making videos. But at the time, I didn't realize he was making videos. And so he commented on one of my videos and said something. And then someone responded to his comment and was like, oh, I love your videos. So I get the comment notification, like, oh, I love your videos. I was thinking it was like a comment on one of my videos. Excuse me. So I go to reply and I realize it's a reply to his thing. And I I recognize his name because at that time my following was like pretty small, so like I would recognize people who would comment regularly. I go check out his videos and instantly like, his, I mean you've probably seen his videos. His energy is just so course, infectious yeah. that like, um, yeah, it just like inspired me to like get back into it. And there's really one thing specifically was uh, there's a Fubu jersey that he found, and I was like, yo, go back and get me that. Like I want that jersey because I remember back in the day my brother used to always wear Fubu. So like, I was like, man, like I want that FUBU jersey. And uh, yeah, so we became cool, became friends. And then from there, uh, we started making trips to the thrift. I stopped making trips to the thrift on the channel in I think 2016, or at least like regularly. 
And then I started back up again in like 2018, 2019. But where the majority of my following comes from is Supreme content. And it's weird because now there's so many new people where like there will be people who have been doing it for like three or four years. They're like, oh, you're into vintage now? And I'm like, bro, like, I was doing this shit 10 years ago too. I just, you just heard about me from Supreme. You know, it's like, and I, I don't know, we'll talk more about this, but I feel like there's this weird thing in the community where like people try to forget their, their roots. And I feel like, I feel like in a year, there's a lot of people who like shit that we're going to look back at the shit they like right now and be like, oh, bro, that shit's so whack, bro. Like, I don't fuck with that, bro. Like, that's fucking weak, bro. Like, and it's just like, you can look at like anything in my channel and there's still stuff that I like from that I liked from when I was doing videos back in 2012. You know, there's obviously things that like fell off, but like there's like parts of that style that I've like kind of taken with me. Each yeah well I, I think you're right and i think there's that there's a stigma of like how long you've been in the game everyone loves to like talk shit about how long people have been in the game and then you have people that have like moved on to true vintage that are like hating on the 90s thing but then it's like you guys were doing that 90s thing a year ago <laughs> anyway like that's where you started right and it's a natural progression because we we want to like move on to something we don't know about we want to continue to learn so once we've like felt like we've kind of learn as much as we can about something we tend to like move on to something else right yeah and that's the thing is like i get moving on but just like don't hate on the thing that you you just liked like you were just posting about it you know like i go back on your feed and i see that so like why are you hating on it it's like to me that's really weird and then and then what i always tell people is like if you're hating on it now right did you ever yeah. truly like it like like why did you or like was it, it just you know? was it just for the cash yeah totally and those are stepping stones. It's like, that's your history. That's who, what got you to where you are now. So yeah, exactly why I hate on it. it. It was part of your path, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. See, like, yeah, because when I, I was looking, kind of doing my research, I'm like, it looked, because I guess you had that big gap of doing the thrift hauls, that it looked like you really kicked it off like a year and a half ago or something back into like this traveling mode that you're doing now. Um, and, and I, I do think, know, I think the first time I saw you to speak of Paul Cantu was on a video with him. Like you've done videos with him a bunch, right? Yeah. What's crazy is me and Paul. So when, before Paul ever sold, me and Paul started selling at the same time. So Paul okay. was getting a bunch of stuff. We became cool online. I was actually in the military and I was stationed at Beale Air Force Base at the time. And his sister was going to school in San Francisco. And so, uh, that culture of like hating on shit has always, I feel like it always existed. But back then it was like the high fashion kids. And we were into like, like Polo, Tommy, FUBU. We have like this thing for people who've been watching the channel forever. It's been like FUBU boys. It's like kind of like a little thing that we, we used to say. Um, and so we started selling uh, when I got out of the military and I moved back to Washington state. He moved up here as well for like six months. And we started a website and it was high fashion vintage, uh, which we always just said HFV. Um, and then we sold on there consistently until uh, basically I started doing Supreme. When I started doing Supreme, it was still high fashion vintage, but I wasn't selling on there anymore just because I was making so much from Supreme. Um, and so I just didn't have the time to really like, you know, we weren't checking comps. We weren't like, you know, and just the market was different. We weren't like, T-shirts weren't selling for thousands of dollars. I mean, I'm sure there were, but not the shit that we were looking for. The shit we were looking for, we were buying for $8, selling it for 16 Like, it's not like we were sitting there trying to, like, maximize the most amount of money out of it. We were just trying to... No, like, I've always noticed that with Paul. Even now, I feel like Paul's website is so cheap. He just goes out, finds his shit for, like... Because he's in Texas. That was a question I had, because I obviously you just said he lived in Washington for a bit. I'm like, how did you guys even hook up? Because you guys are, like, opposite ends of the country. But... yeah. His website's always been dirt cheap, like 12 bucks, 15 bucks, 18 bucks for items. And you're like, there's, on one hand, you're like, he's making all the money on YouTube. The, the vintage is kind of just whatever. But well, the, the thing is, is like, and this is the thing that we wanted to, like, I remember, uh, I, I won't say any names because this person, this person I actually, I fuck with, so I don't want to say there. But I remember I used to link to people's websites and I'd be like, when I, we would post stuff on HFV, Paul didn't do this as much, 
but uh, I would do this all the time when I would post on the site is I would post something. And I'd be like, oh, this is a Tommy Hilfiger jacket. We got it for like 40 bucks. It's over here for 150, you know, and I would literally link to their site, like in the description. So that way someone could come to our site and then buy the piece or see the piece and then click the link and see like, oh, over here, it's three times, four times the amount. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Like when we started selling, the whole thing was, is like, we didn't want to just grab nothing but hype shit. We wanted to grab everything that we liked. You know, we wanted to grab streetwear. So it's like, if it was a printed tag streetwear piece that we thought was cool, we would buy it and then sell it, you know, for just a little bit more. Um, and yeah, anything that we thought we could sell. On the flip side of that, there's so many things that we've sold uh, that like we didn't check comps for that would be like we'd buy for 10 and we'd sell for 20. That was like probably worth, you know, 100, 80, 90, whatever. You know, I don't really care, but I do have friends that I've become cool with now that said they used to buy off HFV uh, and then they would just resell it. <laughs> so they would like literally resell it. <laughs> sure. It's kind of funny. Um, yeah which is cool sure. i mean i don't mind everyone got to make their money you know so that's part of the game and you don't have to fit in exactly you know everyone has their own their own niche going on you yeah. know and that brings me to the question of like i said before paul is probably making at that point tons of money on youtube like for you now what makes more money do you make more money on youtube or do you make more money selling vintage uh i make more money well, really from neither. I, I make, selling vintage is probably my second biggest income. Um, uh, I stopped doing sponsors for a long time. So that used to be my biggest income was sponsorships from YouTube. But YouTube ad revenue is like terrible, you know, at least for me. But I also have videos that are not on my channel anymore that got, <laughs> that got like uh, age restricted. And I feel like that flagged my channel ever since then. Um, is that like you know, from YouTube. partying and shit back in the day? <laughs> yeah, partying and then like, like there was one video as an example. It was like, uh, it actually did like, like almost 400k views, which is crazy because back then I was not getting views, but it was like half naked girl magically appears in my bed and okay. I basically filmed this girl that was basically naked in my bed. And then I put like an emoji over one of our titties. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like stuff like that. But YouTube was just like a different world back then. Like you could cuss, you could do whatever. And you didn't have to worry about getting like age restricted or like, like that video didn't get age restricted for a long time. And the cover was literally like her holding her titties like this. So it's like, it's, it's just like, back then, it was just a different world. But um, and so I don't know, my CPM is terrible. But I only make I tell everyone like I only make like a 1000 to $1,100 a month off YouTube which is like, it's cool. When no people shit. Hear that, but that's crazy. That's not much. Yeah. That's like, I thought know. it would be way more for you. No, that doesn't even pay my rent. Like that's like, you know, yeah. So the CPM, um, metric is based off like the, the viewership and the quality of the viewers you have. And if they're clicking on ads and all that shit. Right. So, uh, I've had this conversation with a couple of people, well, rally roots in particular. And he was like, he's like, yeah, the vintage community is like the worst CPM. Yeah, but what's weird is like I feel like uh like I mean I guess it depends like YouTube like you, I don't really see a lot of ads that would target a particular audience but like I feel pretty lucky in the fact that like for my views like people fuck with me tough like in terms of like uh and I, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that like I'm pretty transparent with things um you know like, I don't want to like and this is not to like bag on the vintage community as a whole like I don't want to like be out there talking well no no but I mean, there, it's it's true though like i think i think a lot of the ad revenue comes from for people who get good cpm it's like the finance realm and that's why i think you see a lot of people in vintage try to do like the finance things i think those do better like even with uh rally roots like he does kind of like a a mix of like vintage uh like entrepreneur stuff like you yeah, know totally. and i mean you you as well i've seen you do i mean you've done a plethora of different styles like book reviews like yeah mine's all over the place i just like <laughs> randomly post some weird shit you so, talked about yeah. nfts crypto. <laughs> but my like, cpm is terrible dude so i i'm nobody to talk about that like i'm i'm just experimenting out here so i i but I, it does shock me that yours is so low because your view you get a lot of views man your all your videos are 20 30 40 50 thousand views and that seems to me like it should be a lot more revenue but 
Yeah, I mean, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 cool though because it's like honestly, um, I don't mind like. I like the fact that I still have to do other things. Like I like the fact that I still have to sell. I like the fact that like, I can't just rely on making videos because I do feel like there's this weird thing of like, uh, people like, like, I don't know, people will like grab stuff in the thrift store. That's not worth anything. And then they'll tell their audience, Oh, I'll sell this for $30 when in reality, like it's not worth anything and they'll sit on it for like decades and they're not going to sell it for $30 but they have to find something that they can sell. Yeah. And like, for me, I can actually say like, Hey, look, like I sold this, this is what I bought it for. Here's the video. And like, I sold it, you know, to my audience or to someone watching, like, these are like the, the actual sales. I, I can't afford to go buy something, uh, you know, to say that it's going to sell if it's not actually going to sell, because like, I don't make enough off YouTube to do that where the content overrides that. So I feel like it's kind of good because it doesn't, conflict like it doesn't create like conflicting interests um but yeah yeah so, I don't false know. information and yeah false information that's good that's a good valid point like people will people who make all the money on youtube will just fake it to make it and make a video and it's just garbage and and it's it's misleading the audience yeah exactly so i feel like that's kind of good and i i like selling like you know um i always tell people like this like i feel like i'm like a crackhead that's selling crack you know like i am addicted to close like and everything like people always will try to watch a video they'll be like oh he's just into this or he's just into that like people always try to pigeonhole me because they pigeonhole themselves and they only like one thing at a time but like i have so much random stuff in my collection that i never wear i wear the same thing every day basically like if i find something that i like i just wear that like these women's pants that i got these little capris i've been wearing these for like <laughs> like the last two months ever since i was in virginia with my boy robin hood um uh, and uh so tell us what else you got what other weird things you got in your collection give us a little like uh highlight reel of uh some of the things okay i interrupt this episode to bring you a word from our sponsor i have a new sponsor thank you very much jim app for supporting the show um and i just put jesse and kelly look who's in the hotel room with me Hello. kelly cole what, uh, what, uh, what and jesse heifetz and I just put them on to Jam App. Okay, Jesse, search something. What are you gonna search? Butthole surfer, Steve. <laughs> what do you got, Kelly? Uh, I'm looking at Tennessee tuxedo shirts because he's my favorite cartoon character. You know, I didn't need another way to be obsessed with vintage t-shirts all day and all night. Another way to search? This is ridiculous. But you got one now. Jesse, what are you finding? A lot of butthole. How many surfers are coming up? We got uh, 224 results in butthole. <laughs> okay, guys. Gem app is your one-stop search solution for vintage clothing. You download the app. You type in what you want to find. It's going to search websites all across the internet. It's going to search eBay. It's going to search Grail. It's going to search Etsy. It's also going to search independent websites like F is in Frank. So there you go. You guys should all go download Gem app. Uh, they support the show, so you should support them. Go download the Gem app and find vintage faster, easier than any way you're doing it right now. Back to the show. Um, so obviously I like a lot of uh, streetwear stuff, so I love like older streetwear. Um, I got like some old like 90s hysteric glamour stuff. I have like old undercover. Um, I think a lot of people that are into like the high fashion world that they don't expect me to have like certain like older Raph Simmons pieces. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I literally collect like everything, but people really only see me in like sweatshirts I and mean, sweat pants and a t-shirt, you know? Cause yeah. that's just where I feel most comfortable. Um, it's kind of the but like, I have so much stuff like, uh, like this is like my, you know, like literally just clothes in my living room everywhere. Um, uh, that will probably never be worn. <laughs> so I have this kind of theory, obviously through pandemic, we saw a huge boom, you know, with vintage t-shirts. It was like this vintage boom, but it was focused all around t-shirts. And that was like the beginning of live selling, which you're doing now as like probably your main source of selling, I would imagine. And, you know, obviously there's a lot, there was a big migration. You had already been doing thrift hauls, you said since like way back, but, 
I think a lot of people got introduced to vintage during the pandemic, right? And then we saw like an influx of people and an influx of streetwear people, an influx of sneaker people. Um, and I think a part of that boom was due to the the uh, mindset that the sneaker culture had on like values of things, right? Because sneaker culture has uh, always 100%. been- 100%. Always been like, yeah, like you buy for a hundred, I'll sell it for a thousand. <sighs> so when they're like, all of a sudden t-shirts are selling for a thousand, that didn't seem like weird to them. Um, but then the other thing I thought of recently was like the fear of God. You remember fear of God when you printed on yeah. the, all the music shirts and shit? Do you think that had a big play in like trans, tr um, like converting sneaker and streetwear people to vintage? Um, I mean, I think just those styles becoming popularized definitely transition people. Like if you look at like some of the most popular tees, um, you know, like for example, the heart shaped box becoming popular, right? By the way, I, I, <laughs> I've been meaning to see Iceman. I think that was a shot at me when he said that in your video, in the podcast. And I wanted really? to ask him if that's a shot. Yeah, I feel like that's a shot at me. But if he's watching this, I want to know if that's a shot at me. I've been planning on uh, coming out and trying to find him. Um, Dude, you got to get him, him on a video. I want to ask him, like, bro, is that a shot? Because it was just like the timing of that was like right after I found a heart-shaped box. And, uh, and like, I'll give credit where credit is due. I will say, like, if I was Iceman, I would feel kind of like uh, – uh, I would feel like – kind of not bitter but like he was into a lot of that stuff like he's actually into a lot of that stuff like even back when he was doing thrifts you know like back then he was into a lot of the stuff that i feel like is cool now um i would i feel like he was like almost like a uh not like a y2k kid because but in the style but i would say like the y2k kids back in the day like never got appreciated for their style but now like the y2k style is so big where now people are like copying their style even though these people were like the like not rejects of society, but definitely not like the cool kids in society, you know? Yeah. And so like, I would say Iceman, kind of a similar concept where like now his, the style that he was doing back then is so popular, but I do feel like that heart shaped box comment was a shot at me. And I want to know Iceman, was it a shot at me? If it was. <laughs> Hopefully he listens to this. We, we, we <laughs> talked, we, we talked here and there. He was yeah. he was like an original huge supporter of Ephesus and Frank from back in the days that you were talking about, you know, when you first probably got put onto the website. And a lot of a lot of people at that point, we were one of the only people online, so we were sort of a reference guide. And he was one of the early supporters, and we kept in touch over the years. And for people that don't know him, he fully at one point erased his whole channel, and he was Crazy. pretty big in in the snapback thrift haul and all that kind of early content for sure. Yeah, definitely. He was like one of the first four, I think. Um, but I don't even remember the comment. What was the comment? Uh, it was something about like people getting like uh, hyped on finding heart shaped boxes or something, okay. and like they think it's and it, it, the comment wasn't untrue in the sense of like I think it was something about like the rarity of it, like not actually being that rare or something. Um, yeah. But just like the timing of him bringing up that particular shirt when I found one in the racks, and that was like probably one of my biggest videos at the time. And like, uh, that's where I was like, uh, I kind of wonder. And then I asked my bro, RJ, who used to make trips to the thrift back in the day as well. He was like one of the first ones he made it with at the same time as all those guys did. Um, I asked him too. And he's like, you know, he's, uh, we have a lot of similar, uh, like thought processes. So he was like, oh, I feel like it could have been. And so I don't know. So, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So I think, uh, yeah, what I was gonna say though is I, I transition. Yeah, well, what I was gonna say is I do think that could have like affected the style, but I really think a lot of it came from dollar amounts, like people realizing that there's money. And I just want to say like, uh, if you're into this only because there's a dollar amount attached to it, like I just think that's whack as fuck. Uh, that's the only thing that I think is whack. I don't care about like styles. I don't have like a particular style that I think like I would never tell someone or judge someone for what they decide to put on their body at the end of the day because like. If that's how you feel comfortable walking out, like, cool. Like, uh, I don't really care. But uh, when it comes to, like, liking this shit just because there's a dollar amount attached to it and then pr pretending that there's some other, like, altruistic cause, like, oh, like, it's good for the environment. It's secondhand, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, like, you're saying that, but you weren't 
like you weren't spending your money on clothes. Like you weren't losing money on clothes. You've never lost money on clothes. You've only ever got into it to make money. And like, I always promote people make money, but like, why work for yourself if you're not truly passionate about the thing that you're working for yourself for? Like you might as well go get a nine to five if you don't really like the shit, you know? And so, yeah, that, that, or like find, find another hustle that is your passion, right? That's your yeah, own exactly. thing because yeah, it's true. You want to love what you do. There's a lot of ways to make money and this is not the easiest. I think a lot of people think that like this hustle is, it's easy to get into, but it's not the easiest and it, it is a grind. Like there's days when you don't find shit and there's days when you can't sell shit, you know, and it's, it's not as easy as everyone puts it out to be. And sure there was that boom. You know, there was that easy time during the pandemic, but I feel like that's over, man. And, and prices have kind of leveled and people have dropped off because they realized it wasn't as easy as they thought it was, you know? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, I would say it's not easy to be successful, be, be successful at it, but it is super easy to make minimum wage doing it. And so I think that that's why so many people still kind of like sit there, but like what I always tell people is like people get so complacent with like whatever their thing is and going like going to the bins and then like thinking that's like this like sweet spot that no one knows about. You know, like people always don't like when I film in the bins and it's like, I tell people like, okay, like you're not really doing anything here. <laughs> like you're waiting here all day for fucking nine to 12 hours a day for new bins. Like you're basically working a minimum wage job to sit here all day at the whim of goodwill, like do something else with your time, you know? But yeah. I don't know. And, and it's, it, there's no control. You're still relying on a bigger, a bigger entity for your income, right? Like goodwill ultimately has the power in that scenario, right? They can close the door down tomorrow and you don't get nothing or they can pull all the vintage in the back and you get nothing. Like there's still somebody else in control, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly. You're not you're really your own boss, you know. Yeah, totally. But, um, so I want to I want to yeah. jump into the. And I'll continue your thought. I was gonna say the transition. Uh, yeah. In terms of the transition, uh, so yeah, I would say like one thing that I'll say is, uh, and I always tell people this is like, uh, when people question like the length of time, I always just tell people like, all the videos are still like there's still videos from ten years ago of me at the thrift, you know like thrifting and reselling what I find. So yeah. like uh, in terms of like the transition, uh, a lot of it was like uh, basically at the time, my stepdad got diagnosed with prostate cancer. Uh, and then when my stepdad went into remission, my mom got diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, my I don't come from like a family with money. Uh, and so when I started like focusing heavy on supreme i would still go thrifting and i would still even make trips to the thrift back then but i would only make one like once a year and they never did good on my channel so that's why it was never like a primary focus but like it was something that i still liked doing um because like i said i like clothes like i don't just like one facet or like one category of clothing uh so um uh, but i leaned in heavy on supreme because i was making so much money from supreme at the time and that's what was helping my parents medical bills and helping my mom and my stepdad you know um and then well, good for you man good for you for stepping up and doing that thank you yeah i mean really it's like thanks to people that watch me because like without that like i i feel like i got so lucky with that shit because i was making almost no money uh the only way i was really surviving was from the gi bill that's how i was paying my rent and like thrifting and stuff like that like i was making money from that but like i said we were buying shirts for eight dollars selling it for 16 bucks like that was basically just paying for like my day-to-day -day shit um and so everything kind of fell into place around the time that i started doing supreme content and like it just kind of like i don't know like the people that watch me ended up helping me majorly because without people supporting me i would have never been able to provide for my family the way that i have you know um and so yeah i did the supreme stuff for a while uh I still buy Supreme a lot. I still think like now Supreme's not cool anymore because it doesn't have a dollar amount attached to it. So just like with vintage, all these people that like, they love the shit. Um, I don't make videos cause the videos don't do good, but like, I still 
love Supreme as a brand. I still think they do cool shit and they reference cool pieces. In fact, they reference the piece that you're currently wearing. Um, the DNA shirt. Not, not, they, not planned to wear this because yeah. of that reason. But yeah, I, lo I love this tee. <laughs> yeah, they reference um, yeah, that so shirt. Much I think they, in like 2017. So, so uh, let's, let's, let's keep on the Supreme topic for a minute because I, I enjoy it. I think it's cool. I think it's relevant. And I, I was a part of it for a short period of time, but I've never really been that deep into streetwear. But like, Obviously, there was a boom time for that too, right? Which was like pre-pandemic. The few years pre-pandemic was like this big boom, Supreme. Era. I mean, there was Supreme's been booming, but like that was like a crazy time, at least oh, in my sure. opinion. Yeah. Um. So, so like, yeah, I guess you're saying you still like the brand. They still reference cool pieces. They still have great designers. Um. You know, tell us your relationship to Supreme and like the whole. Uh, reselling of it and like how it's fallen off now and what what do you what do you think the reason it's fallen off for value is uh i think a lot of it has to do with like uh one like logos and stuff aren't as cool um i mean they are but it just has to be the right logo like you know now it's like a a levi's patch or a stussy logo and it's like the supreme box logo just like people associate clothes with the person so then like there became this weird thing i think where like the box logo was no longer cool because uh they associate it with like you know a certain type of person or like a hype beast or whatever uh and yeah i think that a lot of people that are into clothes that are into supreme or sh shoes whatever they have that problem of just like when something gets adopted by the masses, they no longer like it because now it's associated with this person that they think is like cringy or not cool. Um, and I think that was a big part of it. Uh, it just got like too big and they didn't do a good job of like actually keeping it exclusive. So they would do things like the cool thing about Supreme back in the day was obviously they would do something and then they wouldn't re-release it, but you would start to see some a style that they would do become popular, like mohair sweaters, right? And then they would drop it, it would sell out, and then it would resell. And then like the next season, they're back to dropping mohair sweaters. And then another set of mohair sweaters. And it's like, that becomes the style for like the next three or four seasons until it's no longer cool. And they still do that. Like now there are still things that get popular and resell from Supreme. And then next season they do it again and again until it's no longer reselling. And then they just cut that from the lineup. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's like the big thing with, with them. And I think just them becoming such a big organization uh, and then obviously like selling to like the Carlisle group, I think they've been bought and sold twice now in like the last couple of years. Um, they got, they got sold, they, they got money. sold again. I didn't know that. Yeah. I think it was twice. I'm pretty sure I could be wrong. I think it was one that starts with like a V or maybe that was owned by the Carlisle group. I'm pretty sure it was, they were bought and sold twice. Um, but either way, I just like once they became such a big company that it was like, they had to focus more on profits. And I don't knock yeah. that. Like I said, like, you know, I know a lot of people will be like, Oh, like that's, Oh, Supreme is cringy now. And I'm like, bro, what? Like that, that Kooji jacket they just dropped was so fire. And that junior collab they did, I think like last year that, uh, I, I'm like looking at it. That's why I'm referencing that piece. But yeah, like that piece is so sick. Um, yeah, um, it's when it when you have these subcultures adopt something. Like Supreme was like a community, a sub community of the of just the fashion world, and then it becomes critical mass, and that sub community has to go on and find something new to get attached to because they're like once once like you know, everybody at the high school is wearing it. It's not, you're, it's not a cool club anymore. Right. And it's, it's over, it gets too big. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing in vintage a little bit, like where we're now getting like subcultures within the big culture of it, because you have, it, it has reached, it's getting to reach like a critical mass where just being saying like, I'm in vintage isn't like a club anymore. I mean, it still is, but I think that we're going to see more sub clubs come out of it because you know, it's in the mall now, right? Which is like a whole new concept. So it's interesting. Yeah. I, I I find streetwear fascinating for that reason and, 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 and the whole hype beast culture. Yeah, I think the hype beast culture is weird for me because, you know, obviously I made a lot of money doing that. Uh, and like, even like the crazy outfits, like I would do like crazy 
camo outfits or insane like basically like one piece suits like up in the mountains um because like i was still in the street where when hype beast was like an insult like i remember the first time i ever got called a hype beast it was uh in like 2007 i think and it was like uh, i was wearing sb blazers and this kid commented like oh you're a fucking hype beast and so then like i googled like what is a hype beast because i had no idea i've never heard that term before <laughs> right and then i'm like oh this guy just insults me and i get back and i'm like hey bro like i'll be in tacoma i'll beat the fuck out of you you know like because like i'm just that's all i knew was like oh you're insulting me like okay like what's up you know uh it might have been 2008 it was somewhere around there but i remember it was i was wearing sb blazers and like a undercrown i don't know if you remember the brand undercrown but i was wearing an yeah, undercrown shirt and um and then like some skinny jeans and like uh yeah, it's like, uh, it's weird because then it became this thing where it became like cool and then it became uncool again. Um, but like, so that was kind of a strange thing to me to watch the transition of that word or like the evolution of that word. Um, but I definitely think there's like, I don't know what will happen with vintage. I think it's interesting. I think it has more staying power than just Supreme because there's so many styles. And like you said, there could be more subgenres. So like now, if you're in a true vintage, right? You can be like, oh yeah, bro. Like I don't fuck with that '90s shit. Like you can go hate on other subgenres of vintage if you're like uh, into anime tees, which I feel like the people into anime tees don't really hate on other styles. But you can you can like a particular style and then hate on other styles within vintage, so you can still be in this like exclusive club or whatever. Um, yeah, totally. Which like I think a lot of that stuff is just I don't know. Like I said, I just feel like you should appreciate if you really appreciate clothing appreciate everything there's something interesting about manufacturing manufacturing processes from every era you know like to me like even if you break down shirts and like the differences of like then how they were manufactured in the u.s versus europe and then like the different like uh things that were allowed like the dyes that were used here in the u.s versus the dyes that were used in europe like to me all that stuff is fascinating you know or like even the things that were socially acceptable you know uh to put on shirts you know that's why like i like i always say i like a lot of obscure tees so i have like a lot of like offensive tees um because there's just certain things that were put on shirts even 20 years ago that now if they put it on a shirt they would get canceled you know now they'd be like oh shit you can't put that on a t-shirt um and so i think even like down to the prints i think it's interesting and so i feel like if you don't appreciate all those little things it's just odd to me. Like it's weird to not like those things. Like I would, I would just like I'll appreciate an old Levi's jacket. I'll appreciate a shirt from two thousand and five. Like I have a Hustler shirt from two thousand. It's like the early two thousands. I'm not gonna say what it says on it, but uh, <laughs> but it's it's pretty crazy. We can all guess. Why don't all you guys guess what that shirt says down below? <laughs> <laughs> we'll read all your comments. Yeah. Uh, yeah really it, it is crazy. We are in this like over over sensitive era where none of that stuff flies, and a lot of it was like way out there. You're like, who the fuck yeah. put this on a shirt, right? But For you go sure. to like the mall and go to Spencer's Gifts or something, and there'd be all these crazy T-shirts in there, and it was run of the mill, and you'd have to like sneak away from your mom to go cop some some rude ass shirt. But, yeah, and it's like it's like little things. Like I don't even look at it as like I don't even necessarily say it's just people being overly sensitive as much as like we live in a different era and the only thing that i wish is that we would understand that like if you were doing this 20 years ago you probably would have been like you were not you're not like this altruistic human being that's morally better than your peers like you would have been on the same shit you know um and so i just wish that we would understand that like this is stuff from a particular time and you can look at these pieces just like you look at an old jacket and you can still look back at that piece and say like oh the culture from that is unacceptable like that's you know whatever that's gross that's disgusting blah 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 but you can still look at it as like a fascinating thing like wow that's really interesting that that was cool back then you know um and so i don't know i just i feel like all that stuff's interesting i feel like everyone should appreciate all right, that is it, everyone. If you just watch the 45 minutes and you want more, all you got to do is go down to the show notes, jump on the Patreon, or sub here on YouTube. It's five bucks to join, 
four episodes a month. That's $1.25 an episode. Now, some of you guys, I never really talked about this, but some of you guys might even not know what Patreon is. Patreon is a service that you can subscribe to the show and it supports what we do here. It supports the activity of making this show. It keeps us grinding, keeps us moving forward, motivated to do the show. You can download the Patreon app on your phone and you can, so then you can tap in in your car, play the audio while you're driving around, or you can jump on Patreon on your computer and watch the videos. Uh, it's basically the same. The app is very functional. So don't be afraid of it. Jump on the Patreon or sub here on YouTube to get the full episode. Thank you, Jacob, for coming on the show and being super open and sharing your life with us. Uh, make sure you check out Stock Exchange by Frankie, May 27th at 708 Powell Street. Check out fasinfrankvintage.com or come visit my stores in Vancouver and Squamish. Look it up on our website, the address is, or just Google it, F as in Frank Vintage. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for announcements of lots of cool stuff happening. Toronto, May 27th, we are doing a Yeezy Gap pop-up, the unreleased season of Yeezy. We have it, all the items. We're doing a special pop-up in Toronto, May 27th. So if you're in Toronto, make sure you check that out. Check my IG for updates on that. And uh, be happy, not crappy, everyone. Thank you. If you're jumping on the Patreon, I thank you. If you're just tuning into the 45-minute free version, I also thank you. Peace. See you guys on the next one.